This episode is brought to you by Munton's Malts, a company that is passionate about providing premium malts to brewers worldwide. For over a century, Munton's has been a leading supplier of brewing and distilling malts, offering the finest British malted barley on the market. You can experience the difference Munton's offers by joining a recipe receiving tier of our Trub Club because every kit that ships out now includes premium Munton's malt. You know, we've known the Munton's crew for a long time, and I can tell you, friend, you're going to love brewing with their grains. Ask your local supply shop to carry Munton's malts, or homebrewers can join our Trub Club at homebrewhappyhour.com forward slash club, be a part of the community, and come brew with us. Thank you, Muntons, for supporting our efforts and homebrewers worldwide. Today's show is brought to you by HopsDirect.com. Grown in the esteemed Yakima Valley on the Pewterball family farm, HopsDirect.com offers the widest variety of hops available online at incredibly competitive pricing. It's simple. They grow hops, they sell hops, and they ship hops straight from their family-owned farm to your doorstep. Producing the highest quality hops is HopsDirect.com's passion, and they're proud to be an independent grower in the craft beer industry. Go to HopsDirect.com right now and get what you need to make your brew day better. That's HopsDirect.com. Today's show is brought to you by Imperial Yeast. You hear us gushing over Imperial Yeast all the time, and that's because their yeast performs for us in every batch that we brew. Imperial Yeast is adored by commercial breweries and home brewers alike. Their pitch right pouches are jam-packed with over 200 billion fresh yeast cells guaranteed to deliver flawless, fast fermentations every time. Imperial yeast strains are grown by a team of pro brewers and home brewers who live to help other brewers learn more and ferment better. Join any recipe receiving tier of our Trub Club and get a free upgrade to premium Imperial Yeast with every recipe kit that ships out to you. Learn more at homebrewhappyhour.com forward slash club and come brew with us. Entertaining shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Media Network. Preventing air lot suckback during fermentation, recipe kit gravity readings way off target, and are clean and place systems worth it for a home brewer? This is Homebrew Happy Hour, episode 402. Well, hello and welcome back to another episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. And if you, my friend at home, have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, you could go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on that submit a question link at the top of the page. Even better, call it in. Leave a voicemail to 325-305-6107. And when I use your voicemail on a future episode, you will get yourself a $25 gift card to catconnection.com, which I think is a pretty fair deal. It's a trade-off. It's not my money. It's Todd's money. I can just... Anyway, I am one of your hosts, Joshua Stubing, joined as always by the Director of Operations at cmbecker.com over there, Mr. James Carlson, as well as the President and Chief Keg Washer of KegConnection.com, Mr. Todd Burns, hanging out in in the AI bar. I like that. Guys, how are y'all doing? <laughs> good, good. good. I, I didn't realize in uh, Zoom you can, you can do... You can have AI create virtual backgrounds. Oh no, that was that's real time. You made you told it create a bar. I told it to make a beer a bar with beer taps. No, uh, no, this was a British bar, a British pub. Look at that. That's mm. not bad for a Zoom bot. Yeah, dang. Look at that. I thought you just found a stock photo. It's obviously AI. It looks like you know how Chat GPT does it. This is where I want to be right now. This is where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead, you're in a hotel room getting ready for a procedure. Womp, womp, yep. womp. I won't go into details so that we don't get more one star reviews, but Todd's old. And when you get to his age, you have to get stuff checked out. Anyway, we have a great show lined up. That might actually be the catalyst to getting me to do small talk very quick. <laughs> if we just have things we don't want to talk about, um, I do have some small talk. 
before getting into the three questions and listener feedback that we have lined up. Um, last week, oh, we did mention it last week, but I'll mention it again because we're always adding articles. We're about to add a new vid- video to our youtube.com forward slash homebrew happy hour channel. Todd has been working very hard on the new kegconnection.com blog. Look at you. just You can't help yourself. He just switched his background again to another. Uh, this th- is what I'm going to do the whole show. <laughs> I look. I'm gonna visit all these that, different. So huh? I don't know how you're doing it. Mine won't let me do it. It just tells me to add a photo or blur the background. I haven't even huh. tried. Uh, that's hilarious. Todd, Matri- see if you can add some bald guys in that bar. No, no, no. This is your dream. <laughs> this is your dream bar. I know you don't want them in there. Uh, but no, Todd, j- just hear me real quick because I am including you. I know sometimes you tune me out. Tell the people who maybe missed last week uh, about the blog at kegconnection.com, what you've been doing and what your thought process is, because it is separate from what content we do have at homebrewhappyhour.com. Uh, yeah, so the blog is basically something we've been working on where we're, we're really trying to focus on instructional type videos. So we're trying to help people do things that we, you know, we get questions all the time. Uh the one I'm working on right now is how to clean a keg. And I say I'm working on it. Josh and I are working on it because even though I wrote the article, Josh has been working a lot on the video and yeah. I'm sure he's going to have that done. It is done. I just haven't published it. This, so is, this is, this is, this is going out. We're recording this the same day. We normally record it on Wednesdays and publish Thursdays. The, the podcast goes out today. The video will be tomorrow. The, on on how to clean. I thought a keg. we were always doing them on. Uh, oh no, the articles are done on Monday. Right? Yes, correct. The article will be Monday. Yes. So you'll launch the video tomorrow, and then we'll have links to it, and we'll exactly. publish the article on yep. Monday. Exactly. So that y'all can go and see how. To, and we've got some pretty good ones up already. That I think, like one of them is like an unboxing video where we show you all the different components and how to how to put everything together. And uh, no, the jockey box video. Josh, the, the, the other? The, We've got the jockey box video. Uh, what's that? The jockey box. Ah, the jockey box. Yeah. One. That one's really, I, I really like that one because we, I tell you how to put together a jockey box in the article. And then we also have an accompanying video that shows you exactly how to do it. And I think it's a good system. I'm going to try to do as many of those as possible where we have an article and a video that accompanies it you know, when it makes sense. Uh, the next one we're going to do is force carbonating after that. And the article's already written. We uh, So we had a y- unique problem. We didn't have any uncarbonated beer to shoot the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're all, we're all struggling or rushing to brew some beer so we can do that video for you as soon as possible. That's right. And I'm going to use that to segue. Uh, if y'all are watching this live or the day it publishes, which is Thursday, uh, September 26th, my pop and I tomorrow is brew day live Friday, September 27th at 10 a.m. Central live at youtube.com forward slash homebrew happy hour. Come join our chat. Come hang out with us. Normally we start mashing in at like 9 15 Central so by the time the live stream starts, we have a little bit of time left. This is a Schwartz beer. James, do you think, I know with lagers, I haven't brewed one in a very long time. 90 minute mm-hmm. boils are common, or 90 minute mash. Par- wait, no, pardon me. Not 90 minute mash. 90 minute boils are common. Do you recommend that for a Schwartz beer? Does it not really matter because of... Uh, we're using highly modified malt, so yeah. there's really no reason... But most of the reason for the 90 minute is unmodified malts that go through that step by step process to get them ready for starch conversion. And uh, some of those malts can create quite a bit of DMS. So the purpose of, of doing a vigorous boil and, or a 90 minute boil is to get every bit of that out of it. But I've never had any issues with it. Okay. And that, uh, I've yeah. done it, but it, you just end up having to have a lot more wart to boil off yeah. in 90 minutes and you wouldn't 60 and i oh, don't think it's an issue that's a good point i'd have to compensate on my volume calculations for the additional boil off yeah we'll probably just do 60 i think a 60 minute match 60 minute boil do what we've been doing uh now one more question though for a short spear i did start plugging the stuff into grandfather and it did recommend a mash out do should i keep that should i keep the mash out uh, you know, I've start I've stopped doing it. You no, know, Todd's oh, no convinced kidding. me 
And, and, you know, I, I do, I follow Todd's way, which is move, move the ward out of the mash tun and then top it off with uh, sparge water. And it's, it's worked good for me. So. And, and I do, I do start. So I, I don't do a mash out, but I do start to raise the temperature towards right, the very end. Yeah. So it's kind of a, maybe we could call it a mini mash out i don't know yeah <laughs> many that, mash out we start to raise the temperature with well, the idea one of the things i found is that if i i drain a lot of the wart out and then start sparging so there's almost no water on top so that i am raising the temperature of that uh pretty quickly uh because if you if you try to do it if you try to start sparging without taking it all the way down to the grain bed i think that uh you never get the temperature very high until it gets into the bull kettle. And, and then the other thing, you know, with our system, it's so nice is once you've got it where you want it, you know, 168, 170, you know, you could tell you, the only reason I say 170, 171 is that by the time it goes through the tubing and comes out the other end, it's cooled down a little bit. And then you're right at the perfect sparse temperature. And, uh, you know, what What I find is that uh, then I can turn off the sparge because it'll stay hot long enough to finish and then turn on the boil kettle. And I've already gotten enough liquid in there from taking it down the grain bed that I can actually start to boil while I'm while the whole, almost the whole time I'm doing the sparge. So oh, yeah. Yeah. to me, it's really helpful. Yeah, that makes sense. OK, well, I think it, I'm going to go to Germany now. The way <laughs> y'all 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 aren't. Oh, look at you! You're talking about there. I was going to say you and James. Y'all aren't very far from the Germany trip. Actually, what a like a month and a half. No, department yep. like right at two months. It's like two right, months. Yeah, right at yeah, two months. We're literally during Thanksgiving. I think we're on a plane, aren't we, Todd? Uh, or no? I think y'all y'all on a plane. I don't remember. If I remember y'all staying right, I think that Saturday is when y'all leave. No. I might be wrong or it might be, uh, I, I had the calendar up because I was at lunch. Yeah, I have it. I have it right on my phone. Here. At lunch I yesterday, you, but... I was talking to, uh, with Vilver and the girls at the table and Vilver was asking yep, me right. when the trip was, cause he was like, you're going to be here that whole time. I go, yeah, they have Cyber Monday, that whole, most of that week. So, so we leave Saturday, right? So what, that's and what I saw. Back, yeah. So we'll be gone. 10 days. We'll be completely gone during things the whole week of, of when things. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah. Because that's happening as Thanksgiving oh, is happening. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm at totally. Yeah. Y'all are leaving the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Yep. And then. Yeah. Because it, we have uh, that. The brow actually. The day it ends. The last day of the brow. Is. Uh, is Thanksgiving. So. Yeah. I seriously think it's going to hurt the number of Americans that are attending the brow this year. That's the only thing mm -hmm. maybe they didn't think through. Yeah. Yeah, my, my wife told me uh, you could go with those kind of eyes that said, no, you can't go. So so I'm going to hold down the ship. I'm going to hold down the fort at uh, headquarters from Cyber Monday till y'all get back, which I think y'all get back that Thursday or maybe it's that Wednesday. But uh, don't worry, guys. It'll be in good hands. I'll be fine. Definitely. Yeah, Vilver and then were asking me about it. And then I won't I won't digress too much because I just said how I'm not going to do small talk. Todd, did, he, did you feed into his ears the the woes of steroids? Because he was lecturing me about steroids. I was like, brother, I'm not on steroids yet. Yeah, I told I told <laughs> he started lecturing me about it. And I'm like, I am not I don't I don't take steroids. I don't have any intention of taking them ever and, unless it's for a medical reason. And Joshua is the person that you need to talk to you about. I'll be 40 next year, and I've been saying when I turn 40, I'm going to experiment with my doctor's approval and prescriptions. But Vilver starts the conversation. And I've never had to translate or look up how to say medical terminology in Spanish as much as I did yesterday at lunch. It was extremely yeah. unpleasant. But anyway, uh, yeah, so... Back to the Schwartz beer and all that. Brew Day Live is tomorrow. Also, it's not too late, guys. I'm making a day trip up to headquarters on Monday because it's the last day of the month. It's the last Monday of the month to ship out the dark German lager Schwartz beer for all recipe receiving members at patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour. Thank you to our sponsors, Muntins Malt, HopsDirect.com, and of course, Imperial Yeast for always providing premium ingredients for these delicious kits and i think yeah i have them up on the brew day live stream there too they really are the best we're, we're extremely fortunate i was bagging hops yesterday and uh opening up 
all the one, you know, hop threat sends us fresh hops anytime we ask him. And I forgot how good Magnum smells, guys. All hops smell good, but a fresh bag of Magnum and then mm-hmm. ooh, a fresh bag of middle fruit, which is probably one of my favorite hops of all time. Uh, this is a good recipe, James. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your Friday. You should brew a Schwartz beer. Uh, you should, uh, or actually, yeah. you're you're brewing alt beer, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I thought about doing an alt beer. It's been a while. There, so. There's no wrong choice between those two, my friend. I yeah. like this plan. Yeah, <laughs> I like you brewing a Schwartz, you brewing an alt. Yeah, and me drinking beer. And then the next there time, I, and, and whatever James brews, though, the next time I come up, we can put some of it aside. Uh, uncarbonated so that we can do the forced yep. carbonation video. Win, 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 win. Uh, so we well, got... but that's going to be hard to do because I force carbonate. So most of that's natural. Oh, good. yeah. Well, see, and I was telling Todd the same thing. When I bring beer up, it has, I, I uh, as well as you pressure ferment. So it is for, it is pressurized to some degree. It's maybe not necessarily serving pressure, but it's darn close. It says, you know, it's pretty pretty stinking close. So I don't know, Todd, what you want to do with the forced carb video. Maybe the video morphs into here's why you should pressure ferment. <laughs> and one of the benefits is your beer is already pressurized once you're kegging it. Uh yeah. <laughs> we'll figure it out. I need un I need unfermented. I mean unpressured. Pressured. Yeah, we'll we'll figure it out. Um, I do believe I, I went over the blog. I went over. Oh, the last thing, a little infomercially people who are watching at YouTube. Sorry, but we are wrapping up the 20% off jockey bots kits. It's good now through the end of the month. We launched it mid month at the end of this month. So that's Monday when I'm up there. That's your last day to get 20% off these kits. And Todd, I'm happy to report a lot of people have taken advantage of this sale. It has actually, have, it has have, actually exceeded yeah. my expectations. It's been incredible how many Jockey Bots kits we've been selling. And I, I do attribute it, though, not patting myself and not definitely not patting you on the shoulder, that we have added so much more selection to that category. It's pretty easy for people now to make or find the kit that they're absolutely needing and, it, and not be confused. You know, sometimes... When people are shopping keg kits or whatever on a site like ours or any people that make it customizable, they can, some people report back to us, oh, it's a little overwhelming. What do I want for a faucet, for hose length, for this or for this or whatever? So we just made these jockey bots kits like, hey, you want a 50-foot coil? Here's all the versions of it. You want a 70-foot coil? Here's all the versions of it. You want a 120-foot coil. So go over to kegconnection.com, guys. And you find on the front page, you'll see the banner. 20% off is automatically applied there. And then on the rest of your order, if you add anything to it and you use the promo code HHH, all that stuff will get an additional 5% off of it. So it's a good time right now to go to kekconnection.com. Okay, teleprompt or tele <laughs> infomercial hat taken off. We are now ready for the show before I get into the question. It's time for listener feedback. I received earlier this week a very nice little email. It's our buddy Jeremy from Arizona, and he wrote in, congrats on 400 episodes. I think it's incredible for a podcast to last so long, and I commend you all for sticking with it. I also want to thank you for the Trub Club Brew of the Month kits you ship. I've been a proud member for almost one full year and haven't had a bad beer yet. I wanted to specifically give praise to Imperial Yeast for a superior product. I've used many different brands of yeast in my years of brewing, and Imperial truly stands above the rest. I don't know how they do it, but I'm always blown away by how fast my fermentations finish and by how incredible my batches turn out. Cheers to more great beer from the Chub Club, and cheers to another 400 episodes. Jeremy, thank you for the feedback. I don't know about another 400. I mean, I mean, we could in theory. Uh, I'm not saying I don't want the companies to be around. 400's a lot. I actually looked it up. Uh, some of our favorite shows, just from anecdotally talking to each other. I know, James, you love Top Gear. Do you know how many episodes Top Gear finished with? No clue. Two- I mean, you got to include the, the Grand Tour. Oh, shoot. And the mini specials. And well, I mean, they've been doing it for 20 years. So, well, so gr- gr- Top Gear alone, I, I thought it'd be more than this, was 275. So probably double that maybe for and so they probably had around 400 episodes when you include uh grand tour and all that maybe uh seinfeld had 180 episodes one of my favorite shows ever cheers which i felt like cheers went on forever 
273. So they all made a lot more money than we ever will. But the point is, we're still here. <laughs> We're still, yeah. <laughs> we're still, we're still going. We're Suck. not the Simpsons, but we're getting there. Yeah, I noticed I didn't put them on the list. I didn't put sign. I mean, I didn't put uh, South Park on here. All these shows yeah. that have probably four digits of episodes, but it is, it actually really is incredible uh, that to have a show that long. And, and a lot of the credit, like I said, when James came around full time working for Todd at around episode forty five or forty six, that was when you were like, "Hey, why don't you do the podcast again? You should launch that back up." And I was like, why? Ugh, ugh, ugh. <laughs> but we did. And look, here yeah. we are. And you stuck with it every week. I got to come in. We it's have. your show. You do a good job. I appreciate it. It, it is uh, easily the most fun I have any given week. And Jeremy, thank you so much for writing that in. Um, I, I was just having, I'm, I'm so ADD. Isn't the guy from Top Gear also named Jeremy? Is that just a... It, isn't that one of the Jeremy guys' names? Jeremy Clarkson, <laughs> Clarkson, Richard Hammond, and James May. That's right. Jeremy Clarkson is who I'm thinking of. I follow him on Twitter. He's a, he's a funny yeah. guy. He's a real funny he guy. He is a funny dude. Yeah. Anyways, uh, with all that being said, thank you again. A reminder, if you email us a question or feedback like that, and I use it, you get yourself a $15 gift card. But even better, you could call in your questions or feedback to 325-305-6107. And when I use it, not if, because I'm desperate, when I use it on a future episode, get yourself a $25 gift card to kegconnection.com. Like our first question of the show. There is the gong of questions. It's our buddy Gary from Louisiana. Hi, guys. Uh, quick question for you. I made a, or brewed a uh, wheat ale today, small batch, uh, just two and a half gallons uh, in the fermenter. And the fermenter is six and a half gallons so i put that in the bubbler fermenter and uh put the yeast on it as usual but uh noticed a little while later that the water inside or the 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 water inside of the uh airlock is starting to drip into the finished beer at the bottom or the wart um I don't like it doing that. I'm just curious as to why it might be. I took the airlock off and replaced it with some sanitized uh, tinfoil that'll cover as an airlock. Anyway, let me know when you can. Thanks, guys. Gary, it's a good question. And I, I y- y'all might go, like, James, you might tell me, that's not really suck bad, Josh. You, you labeled that wrong. I, that's what I consider it because I don't know what else would be causing your airlock to, like, here. here's the first thought I had. Well, just... Oh, this temperature change can cause that. Well, well, and, well, first off, could it also, so you, you have a fill line, right? Oh, I should have actually gotten an airlock in here. So did, did you, did you, uh, before you answer the question, he's just talking about a bucket, right? Or a, he's not a, it's just a, he just has a, one of the bubblers that you stick That's on a, something and yep. it's not under any kind of pressure or anything. Correct. That's how I took it. Yep. Correct. Yeah. It's just, it's just filling up. It's getting some stuff in there probably, and it's 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 overfilling and then dripping down is what's happening. I, it, I mean, if if he just put water, that's it's an interesting thing because a lot of people put sanitizer in there. I'm always nervous about putting much sanitizer in the airlock for that reason. Is that if it starts to fill up, it'll drip out, and then you get some in there. That so if he just has water in it. It won't affect anything. And even if he has sanitizer, if it's a real low mix, it's probably not going to hurt. you got to elaborate a little, I think, on what you mean by fill up, because I can make assumptions. But if you like, you mean. It, it, so when you when you have the high crowds and a lot of times it'll it'll actually push up to the top of the lid and put some stuff in there. I bet it's dirty and has it just has stuff in there that, that pushed up like the bubbles themselves will have liquid and I'm just like when you blow bubbles with a you know with soap and it, it's pushing up in there and filling it uh, with some of that liquid and then that it's filling it so high that it just goes over the top displacement and and, okay I was gonna say because I again I don't have a bubbler handy here I have a ton of them in the garage uh the fill line is probably halfway up to the, the where you know you it would have to be to go in and out so yeah you're saying high Krausen pushing it itself in there and then bringing it back whenever it starts going down. And so then your liquids just start dripping in. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, um, I, I don't want to 
say something dumb. I might have to edit this out. Or well, that'd be the whole show. I'd have to edit the whole thing out. The, the James, the liquid in the bubbler is just for the visualization of fermentation, right? It serves no other function other than to show you activity. Like in theory, the airlock. No, no, it, oh, no. it does. It, it keeps the. It's an oh, airlock. I'm sorry, you asked James. I'm sorry. No, no, go for it, James. Make me feel stupid. No, go ahead, <laughs> No, I was. Uh, no, no, just yeah. It, no, it, it stops the stuff from coming in. That's the whole point of the bubbler. It it stops air from coming back in. Yeah, it stops the bad things from coming into your beer and infecting it. Now, gotcha. okay, so. You okay? Because I don't always usually fill it to the fill line, and maybe I should. Well, actually, since I've been pressure fermenting, you, you don't have to. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say, well, since I've been pressure fermenting, I don't even use a bubbler. I use a spunding valve, and uh, I, the way I know that activity is still going on is that little hiss. Well, when I've been using Trons, actually, which is the most over machined, oh, d- just overkill type of spunding valve, but I highly recommend it. Uh, he actually does have a little thing he calls the fermometer that you can fill up and it shows it, but it doesn't operate like a traditional airlock. But um, so, yeah, and James, you don't use airlocks anymore either. Yeah. Uh, right. Well, I use a PRV and it ap- actually has a airlock built into it. So, so then, in y'all's opinion, I'll throw it to you, Todd. Or uh, spunding valve. What, what do you think he could do about this? Like, what, what do you think could be done to prevent this from happening? And if you see it happening, what is the right step to do? Like what he did, replace it with. If he has, if he's got it with, if it's just water that he's, that he filled it with originally, you know, and, and you don't have to fill it to the fill line. You just have to fill it up to where that thing can pop up and down. Right. But if it's just water, I would, what I would do is not worry about it. Yeah. It's not going to mess up your beer. Now, one thing that you will that will happen, I've had this happen many times, I'm sure James has too, is that it, it starts to get that stuff in there and fill and fill and fill and it clogs it. And then it blows the either blows the lid out or it blows the uh, bubbler off the top. And uh, he said it was a wheat beer. Wheat is beers are the absolute uh Motor, most yeah. Motorboat kings. I mean they're they're so <laughs> strong. If I brew a wheat beer, I don't use a bubbler. I use a hose and go into a bucket. And uh, if you, all you have is a bubbler, you can just stick the hose on the, on the, take the thing out and stick the hose down on that, uh, on that part that sticks up. If you've got a hose the right size, or you can, I mean, there's lots of ways to do it. But if I'm brewing a, like a half of Eisen, I would never use a bubbler because almost every time I've brewed one and I've used a bubbler, I've ended up clogging up the bubbler and, and having a wall full of, of, uh, High crowds and wart, whatever you call it, on my wall and floor and everywhere else. My dad will have to remind me. I think when we brewed a Hellevisen, which was one of the popular kits that we used to sell on the website, uh, I believe that was the one that he came into his little game room that we used for fermenting with it all over the ceiling. Because, yeah, yeah. It, it just was. Have you ever had that happen, James, where it blows out? Uh, trying to think. I can't remember a time when that's happened. To me, yeah, I've I've had to take one of those mop things, the the ones that we use that have the flat surface, and and actually mop the walls in my <laughs> in my barn before. Yeah. <laughs> you, by the way, I don't. I got that. Uh, I got that uh, Stefan Hefeweizen yeast, and you never brewed a, a wheat beer for your wife. I might throw. You were trying so hard to throw me under the bus. Oh, she's there. Look, oh no, 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 you don't. You were throwing. I guarantee you, James. When I was staying there, he was like, "Oh, oh, you have headphones on. She can't hear me." When I was at the barn, every chance he can take, he throws me under the bus. Liz, I don't think Josh appreciates you enough. Look, he he did this or he did that. It was. <laughs> I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna remind her. Like, oh, Liz, th- this yeast went bad. Did Todd never brew that wheat beer for you? Huh. <laughs> You got to brew, dude. I was just telling James yesterday, I was trying to calculate when's the last time you brewed. I don't think you brewed. I just, all... I just have, you know, I had my dad's party and we were trying to get ready for that. And I've had a lot of things going on. I'm, I'll start again, but it, I, I don't know when, it, when it'll be. It's, I've got so much in the, in the next month, two months, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. Uh, wrapping up Gary's question before I go down any other rabbit holes. So, uh, James, is there any preventative mm-hmm. he can do, or is this all reactionary? Like, you're sorry, you can't really do much until it actually happens for, for the dripping. Well, I agree with Todd. You just take the inside out of that three-piece and run a hose into a bucket and 
And I think, yeah, I think that'll, that'll fix this problem. Yeah. Especially on wheat beers, right? On something that's going to have vigorous activity and primary yeah. fermentation. Yeah. Uh, Gary, I think that's about it. If you're watching at youtube.com forward slash homebrew happy hour and you have some feedback, leave it in the comments below while you're there. Smash that like button, follow the, ch or subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification, all the stuff that YouTube marketers have told me I'm supposed to say, insert those here. And also, if you want to get yourself a $25 gift card like our buddy Gary just did, call in a question at 325-305-6107. You can text that same hotline or you can email me and you'll still get yourself a $15 gift card like our second question of the show. Our buddy Ryan emailed me and he said, hi, Josh. Since Keg Connection doesn't sell recipe brew kits anymore, I have been buying recipes from another popular online store. Don't judge me too harshly. I haven't made my own recipes or bought individual ingredients because I like to keep things simple. With that being said, the last several recipe kits I have brewed, I've been way off on my gravity. I am hitting the temperatures that the printed instructions tell me to aim for. I am following every step down to the letter. Still, I am eight plus points high or low compared to the printed target numbers. What gives? How should I best resolve this? And then he had a bunch of big ranting stuff about the show, blah, 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 blah. Ryan, Ryan, thank you so much for the email. I have never formulated a recipe in my life. Confession. It's all uh, either been James or Lorena and me and my dad might tweak it a little bit and may, and then now it's ours. Hey, I'm the, uh, is it, was it Edison who stole from, or was it Tesla? Who's either way. I'm the copycat. That's what I do. And, it, and then I slap my thing like, oh, yeah, that's mine. I did that. But what, what do you mean Edison or Tesla that stole? Didn't uh, didn't uh, Edison steal uh, uh, something? From no, Tesla? One, one was but one believed in AC and the other one believed in DC. OK, see, I can't even get history right. Um, I could write. I could make movies for Netflix. That's how bad with history I am. Anyway, uh, this question from Ryan, though, with being way off. Let me just say my piece, and then I'm going to throw it to one of you first. If the beer is tasting good, that's all I care about. There have been batches my dad and I forgot to do numbers throughout the brew day because we're busy doing other stuff. The batch turned out great. We didn't even care. I don't. I want to say the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is the last one I can think of. And Todd, you had a keg of it up there. You can attest to it. We have no idea what the ABV ended up being. We don't know what our starting gravity was, what our final gravity was. And it was a right. delicious, it was a delicious beer. So I will say, Ryan, to give you some encouragement, if you're making good beer, don't stress too much about the numbers. But James, he is stressing because a paper says one thing and his yeah. hydrometer is saying another. How do you resolve it? Or what are some of the variable or the factors that may be contributing to this and Ryan's? Well, there, to me personally, I don't think there's enough information in this to, to be able to diagnose it. Is he extract brewing? Is he all grain brewing? He's all grain brewing. Is he doing a, a, a rim or a three tier setup with circulation? Is he doing uh, a cooler and doing a, a brewing a bag system? I mean, there's a lot of things like one of the things that when I was first started all grain brewing is I would, when I got done with the mash, I would taste the grain or after the sparge, I would taste the grain and see if there's any sugar left over. And you could usually tasting the grain, you usually tell what your efficiency is. So I would say, you know, if if you're rinsing or you're doing a sparge, make sure you're in the 170 degree range. Because if you're trying to sparge with any cooler water than that, then you're not getting all the sugars out of the grain bed. If you're doing recirculation and you're not doing brewing a bag or a cooler, then you want to make and make sure that you've got equal uh, draining through the whole grain bed from the top to the bottom. So sometimes what can happen, especially most systems, commercial systems that we've looked at when we were researching the brow tog, they were picked up on the middle most of the time. It was it had a small false bottom just a little bit off the floor of the kettle, but it was drawing from the middle. So what happens is as that water is going through the grain bed, it actually creates little tunnels to, to meet in the middle. So you can, you, that's why it's important the first few, I'd say 30 minutes of the mash, keep stirring it because you want to break that up. You want to get as much efficiency, you want to get as much sugars out of the grain and starch conversion as possible. Uh, the one thing that's cool about our system is two inches, a full two inches, the whole thing's the grain beds above the bottom of the, the floor of the kettle. 
And that promotes a lot more even rinsing of the grains as it's going over and we're going through the mash. Not just the mash, but the sparge process. We're able to rinse more of that evenly into, and that's why we see such high efficiency numbers. So there's a lot of a lot of things to take into account when your efficiency is lower. If you just can't figure it out, you're going to have to plug those numbers into a brewing software yep. like Brewer's Friend, and you can accommodate for that loss, and then you can hit your numbers a little easier. When you were making recipes, like before the acquisition of Homebrew Supply, and you know we had you basically which doubled our database of recipes. You were making every single one that Cat Connection had. Was there a system of brewing you had in mind that was like a catch-all, or was it was it the efficiency? I guess that's the catch-all. I just I just worked for seventy percent because that's all in all pretty average. But you know some of those systems like the brow tags consistently over eighty percent. Yeah, and just ask Todd. Just because we're able to rinse the grain bed a lot more efficiently efficiently than some other systems. Yeah, uh, uh, this is your chance, Todd, to now tell us about how efficient your system is. <laughs> My system is so efficient. <laughs> how uh, efficient is it? No, I, I mean, I, you know, he, what he, the the amount that he's talking about being off. When he says eight points, he, he's talking about at the third column, right? Like yeah. point zero, oh, instead yeah. of point zero five two, he's hitting point six, right? I didn't Something ask, like but that. he I mean, has to be. There's no way. Or that point he... five versus point five. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's off, but it's, I mean, when you're brewing beer, there's a lot of variables and, and, and everybody uses different systems and everybody has different efficiency. And that's exactly, that's what happens. I mean, at some point, what's strange with him or what he's saying is that he's off both ways. If he was off one way, I think it would be easy to solve the issue. But would it, but if he's off both ways, then that, that's a little different because it's it's not that his system's always more efficient or less efficient. It's, uh, it, you know, it's something else. I, I I didn't ask uh, enough questions to follow up with, but when I did reply to him, because he did, he had a bunch of nice things to say about the show. He's considering joining the Trub Club, so I had to suck up. I was like, oh, here we go. No, but kidding aside, when I reached back out to him, I, when I one piece of advice I told him was, if you are literally following the instructions to a T, give the feedback to the people who made the recipe. And Absolutely. I'm, and I'm not saying that to to take a, I mean, I took his question. He's going to get a $15 gift card. But I mean, they're the ones who came up with the numbers. There is a chance their numbers on that specific recipe were wrong. Like that they, and no one said anything. We had, oh, do I have a recipe sheet here? There was some homebrew supply ones. They, they weren't James' fault. It was technically Joe's fault. Uh, but we had <laughs> we we had a chart of like Delta and Fitter, whatever. And my dad, I think, is the one who pointed out, like, son, that chart's wrong. I was like, what are you talking about, dad? Because here, here I am thinking like we're professionals or whatever. The chart that was always at the bottom right of every front page of the homebrew supply recipes, totally made up. Totally wrong. Those numbers weren't real. They're either placeholders at some point or something. I'll have to show y'all what I mean, the two of you, not y'all as in the YouTube people. But um, yeah. either way, there is a chance those people, and when I was updating recipe kits or whatever, sometimes I would forget to, because it's just a, we, we take a PDF and we clone it and then we change the information. There is a chance that the, the recipes he's buying, that's what happened with this retailer. They didn't go and, and update fermentation temp they didn't update og yeah. range they didn't I, I'm, I'm thinking that's what it could be because being but like todd did say being that far off it, there's so many variables we, we well, can't i mean here here's the other thing take a brewing program and plug I all that just stuff gonna in. say that okay yeah yeah, yeah no you're go ahead I'm, you're uh, yeah wrong. just take take brewer's friend and plug all the information in it'll tell you what it should be it is going to ask you for the efficiency of your system so you have to be able to calculate that, but that's that's one of the great things about it. Brew a batch, put it all in, brew a batch, and then if it's off, you know that your efficiency is different than than what you put in, and you can start to adjust your efficiency. With my system, I had to take it way up. But uh, <laughs> well, now that, that's the po another point. If if Todd was trying, if we were trying to do a, a a recipe, and let's say we got back into the business, and we were basing them off of what we're brewing on our system. We'd have to back those numbers way off. Way, yeah. <laughs> people's expectations in reality would be two separate things. So, You're right. We would be getting you know, this the question. The numbers that we plug into our brewer software 
Well, you can scale that or you can change it by just changing the efficiency. And, and that's going to change the recipe program. So you have to have a little safety factor. When I was doing recipes, I knew not everybody's going to hit 70, but more of them would hit 70 than if I tried to build a recipe on 80 and save money on grains. Right. It's just it's just one of those things that you, you're going to have to expect if you do a recipe, you're going to have to create that recipe for 65, 75% efficient. There's 60 to 70, 65 to 70% efficiency is what I would always shoot for because that gives you a leeway. Uh, some people are going to do a little better. Some people can do a little less, but the, most of the people are going to get close to that 70. And thankfully, uh, with, with calculators, software, Brewer's Friend, um, Bruce Beersmith, uh, Brew Father, all those, all those software, we use Brewer's Friend, but all the software, they do a good job of also having profiles if you are using a system that's not some homemade concoction, like just a random kettle or whatever. If you're using an all-in-one that is sold from retailers or if you're using this, you know, a brew in a bag and you you can type all that in and it does a very good job of even calculating projected efficiency. Uh, yeah. Like I said, we, but, but like I said earlier, the most important thing is people focus on the mash and that's important too. Uh, but if you can't rinse the sugars off the grain bed, that's going to seriously affect your efficiency. So maybe it's, it, Ryan, maybe what you're doing is you're just not rinsing it correctly, and that's you're leaving a bunch of sugar in that grain bed. The best way to tell is grab some, and, and I'm not talking right off the top because those are going to be uh, dig down deep with your brew spoon and see and just taste in different areas to see if you can notice a difference. Is it sweet in the middle? Is it sweet on the outside? You know, then try to figure out a way of improving the way you rinse those grains and get those sugars because. You can't if you can't rinse evenly. You're not going to get the full yield of sugar that's hidden in there. It's like grains of gold dust. You want to get it all out. And if you can't, your efficiency you'll see that in gravity. I can't go full salesman mode because I don't think we even have. Do we have what one or two brow tabs we can even sell before we're? I mean, we we didn't end up rebuying them, restocking them. I wish the project was in theory, guys. If y'all are going to be brewing herms, this is literally the one system that you should be using. And we threw a bunch of money at marketing it and all that, and people are like, okay, we're very snail pace at it. But either way, I I, I was going to say that's why how fortunate you and Todd are brewing on that because the the efficiency is very predict is reliable and predictably high. Like every time, like y'all, y'all are getting 80% uh, efficiency because of the way the system is with that clearance at the bottom for the mash, with the way it recirculates, and then with the way that you're sparging, which that's one of my favorite parts yeah. of the system. This is totally just stupid dorky stuff. The sparge arm that you source that you, that y'all use, it's like a sprinkler mm -hmm. head. I don't even know what it is. Yeah. It's a stainless steel commercial sprinkler head. They're so cool. I told my dad, my dad, yeah. we've been talking forever about him making us a sparge arm for the, the grain fod, because right now we just, you know, manually take turns, you know, spreading it around with that little uh, aeration thing that we used to sell for keg connection. And um, mm -hmm. I want something more stationary. I want to, I want a sparge arm with the stainless steel commercial uh, sprinkler head. But anyway, <laughs> Ryan, thank you so much for submitting that question. Todd, you had taken off and I don't know if you have anything to add before I move on to our third and final question. Uh, no. Perfect. A well, I was lo I'm losing battery power, but I think I got it working now. I was I was afraid my computer was going to shut off. Yeah, we the show will go on. Uh, Ryan, thank you so <laughs> much for submitting that question. A reminder: if you text or email me, you get yourself a, a question, and I use it on a future episode. You get yourself a fifteen dollar gift card to catconnection.com. But even better, call our hotline at three two five three zero five. 6107. I will use your voicemail question on a future episode because I'm desperate. And you will get yourself a $25 gift card like our third and final question of the show. There's the gong of questions. It's our buddy Rob from Lavernia, Texas. Hello, Todd, James, and Joshua. Um, actually, I'm hoping that my order of salutation has no bearing on whether or not this question makes it on the show. But if, uh, if you're contemplating that, Josh, too much, just just consider it a descending age order and, and maybe nothing more. Uh, this is Rob from Lavernia, Texas. Um, been uh, listening to your show for a few years, and I still enjoy the heck out of it. And I've, I've been contemplating something for a while, so I thought I'd submit a question. Anyway, 
Um, I thought about spending some money on a clean in place system for my homebrew fermenter, um, but my spidey sense is telling me that those systems were likely designed for commercial systems for obvious reasons and maybe crept into the homebrew market for the lazy homebrewer. Um, and no offense to those lazy homebrewers out there. <clears throat> Seems like uh, with the size of homebrew fermenters, pulling them apart and uh, maybe a thorough cleaning is the best option. But I'd be interested in learning your experience, if you have any, with these contraptions and or your opinion on their ability to clean a homebrew fermenter effectively. Um, so looking forward to hearing uh, an answer. And uh, thank you for doing all the things that you do for the homebrew community. Take care. The things we do for the homebrew community. It's not much, but you're welcome. Uh, (laughs) Rob, thank you for submitting the question. Yeah, Lavernia, right down the road from us. It's in the San Antonio area. Um, Clean in place. I think Todd calls that his right arm. You just hold the fermenter and you... (laughs) (laughs) I have seen clean in place things. I think Blickman was one of the first ones to make a consumer level one that that I can remember. Blickman... For, people can say whatever they want in regards to like, oh, they're expensive, this or that. They've always been like bleeding edge in regards to innovating products. Like I was just showing James yesterday. They they're doing that corny cor- fermenter. It's a the keg, cornicle. the cornicle, but the, only the keg part that has the removable bottom. They did them for half off. I think it was only yesterday. So if you're listening to this now, like I'd love a brand new keg for seventy dollars. Yeah, you missed out. Sorry, but who would have thought to do that? Right? Like, hey, we can make a keg. And have it go on to this conical attachment. They charge way too much money, but it's it, it, in in theory, like you could tell it's a whole company full of engineers. Those guys are nerds. We've been out drinking with them. Once some of my favorite drinking buddies ever, but uh, Tom and, and John, they're really good guys. I can't, and Doug, when he was with them, I can't keep up with them, but maybe that's how they come up with their ideas. They just get smashed. Anyway, Rob's question. Uh, I, I will throw it to you first, Todd. Because you are the most familiar of the three of us in regards to sourcing equipment for cleaning, sanitizing, all that stuff. We've never carried any of those kind of clean in place ball heads or whatever. Is it because they're not feasible or, or for a home brewer or is it just because you never really looked into it and cleaning stuff is just part of your process that's not that difficult? No, I mean, I, I think that uh, you could certainly do a clean in place system. Um, I mean, really all you need is a, a pump. I mean, you could fill the, uh, there, I mean, there's a couple of ways you could do it. You could have, you know, liquid going in and coming out into like a bucket or something like that with a pump, or you could just fill the, the fermenter completely full and just have it circulate. Um, you know, so you, we've got like on our, I mean, every fermenter is different, so there's not one answer to this, but like on our fermenters, we have more than one port. So you could theoretically, you know, you, even where, like James, like where the, uh, uh, you, you could take two different ports and have one in and one out in a pump and then circulate it and do all of that. I mean, yeah. you, you fill it up. I mean, in, in some ways, maybe it would make sense for me because I have to take my fermenter outside to clean it right now, although I'm getting better at that. Um, I don't know. It just, it seems like a lot of work instead of just taking the fermenter outside, filling it full of water and being done with it. Right. Uh, I, it, we, you know, I've got a CIP ball and I tried it a couple of times with a pump and then I just pulled the suction off the bottom of the, the, the valve at the bottom and just had yep. it go. But it did not remove the stuck Krausen that's dried at the very top of the wart line. And I don't know about you, but I'm not comfortable putting fresh wart over. You can feel it with your hands, too. And in my both times I've tried it, I couldn't get I had to get in there and scrub it with a with a scotch brot pad because it wouldn't come off any other way. So or I mean, not a not a scotch. You're talking about one of those ball stainless steel pads, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. at that time I was using the dish. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. So you, yeah. yeah, so I always have to scrub it too. I mean, I'm sure I know big breweries do it, but at some point, it's just. Well, I think sometimes you come up with a 
with a solution that's more complicated than the problem. When hear me out, uh, or correct me if I'm wrong, I've said stupid stuff this episode already. Commercial breweries are also using caustic cleaners with their clean, right? I mean, they're using like like heavy, heavier duty type of stuff coming out of their cleaning place. It's not just water and brew clean or, or whatever. Yeah, no, it's it's a city, right? I know, uh, yeah. Rick has one that for commercial bright tanks and. It's pretty potent stuff. That, right. Yeah, you, yeah. you could take the lid off of ours, James, and have it go back into the top. And I guess you could then scrub it some. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's to I mean, me, it's, it's easier it's, just. Yeah. By the time you do that, you might as well just clean everything because everything <laughs> below the wart line is not going to. Yeah, you're going to be able to spray that out pretty easy. But yeah. my whole point is. Above the wart line where that Krausen's yeah. dry. I know what you mean. Yeah. It turns rock hard. Oh, and, yeah. You know, and I haven't had any luck with a CIP ball and a, and a chugger pump in pulling that off. Right. I, I'm, I agree with those premise that the, the effort and the budget is not worth it when, you know, and, and Todd, don't throw me under the bus yet because typically cleaning is when I try to, to bail when, when we brew at your place. Um, Actually, that one time Lorena was there, I think I, I did some cleaning and she was like, oh, you're doing something today and clap for me and all that. Uh, <laughs> That's good. But, but but the fermenter, I've never had to clean yours because I'm not ever really around when it's time to keg. You, you're you using a big old CF-15, so it's one of the bigger spikes that can hold uh, 18 gallons of total volume, I think, or 19 gallons of total volume. It's and, 19, yeah. And you frail crippled old man now with the bum neck are still able to relatively easily get it out on your porch and clean it yourself without major yeah, issue. I, mean, I use a dolly now though oh well, I, okay i thought it was on casters for some reason it's not it uh it has legs but now i use it even if it was on casters i'd probably still i mean it's easy to pull the dolly up there put you know tilt it on there and then i pull it out with the dolly my bigger point being you can do it without much hassle, and it's not right. like it's a huge, long part of your day. You are obviously clean in place at best case. You're not – it's automated, for for lack of a better word, where you're not in there by manually doing it. It runs through a process like a dishwasher, and then when it's done, you know, it's done. So how cleaning that big old CF-15 and, and to the point of you being happy with it and putting it back in there, what is that, a 30-minute, maybe 45-minute process for you? Oh, it's th it's a three day process because so, I'm always I, I fill it up full of water and then I'm too oh, lazy to so finish it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, so no, it, it, I mean it's 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 not thirty minutes worth of work. It's it's pulling it out there, filling it, and then I let it sit for hours. I meant of work. And then I, I meant of work. I, well, maybe it's thirty minutes. Maybe it's twenty yeah. minutes worth of work. Well, that's but what I, I, yeah. well, James. You do it all the time at the office. What's your total? Not including the soaking. What's your total work time on it? I'd say thirty minutes or less. Right? Yeah, yeah. That that. Well, I was just say on the firm zillas that we have, which are about thirteen gallons, that that's like seven minutes of work. And that and that uh, and when James is talking about that Krausen crust, I I I know exactly what you mean. It happens every batch, and there's no way the limitations on these plastic ones, especially. I can't put hot enough water in there to deal with Krausen crust. I have to get a rat and then just manually scrub it off until it's gone. And I'm certainly not going to want to put fresh wort on top of or inside of a fermenter that has any of that residuals left over. Like you were talking about James, that's just a bad idea yeah. for that next batch. And, and I'm sure the commercial, you, 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 you can't take, you know, the big commercial stuff, but they're using really hot water and, or, or there's you, some people use steamers. There's a lot of higher end equipment that they're using. In, in conjunction with the CIP balls. Yeah, I agree. So this is one of those ones where I'm totally open, guys. If you're watching at youtube.com forward slash homebrew happy hour, leave it in the comments below. If we're dumb, you're like, no, CIP is game changing. And here's why. And here's what I do. We're open to that. We're old dogs. Show us a new trick. You can use words like moron and stuff like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Okay. And and I, I'm, I'm actually pleading with people. Do it in the comments, not in the reviews. Oh, God. <laughs> Go to the comment section and tear me a new one. I know I'm not funny. I know I'm bald. Say all that in the comments. Quit leaving us reviews like that. Those are reviews are forever. 
Anyways, I think that about wraps up Rob's question. Uh, we're going to get like 10 bad reviews after you said that. Yeah, oh, like, <laughs> hey, hey, I will say this, though. We've had uh, I don't you you if, they, if people don't textually write them, I don't see them uh, like, as in like I can only see if the five star goes up, the four star goes up or whatever. We had uh, two one stars this year, but they didn't leave a textual reason why. You're a coward. Where, where, where is this? On, on iTunes. YouTube on or? app. No, you don't listen when I talk. On Apple Podcast, in our in our account, on our Apple Connect uh-huh. or Podcast Connect, you you don't have it. I I don't have it. It's so that's a, yeah, why I have it. yeah. I can go in and see. And like I said, on the review, oh, you could go on the front end of Apple Podcast. Like James has an iPhone, and he can go see. We're at like a four point six or four point seven with however many reviews. And if you were to pay attention, you could see, oh, next week we're, we're still at a 4.6, but we have a hundred and whatever more. And you could go look at the stars and go, oh, that one moved up. So it must have been a five-star review. And they just didn't leave anything textual. This year, because uh, I'm, I'm a little neurotic and I keep a, a track of things that are a waste of time and I shouldn't, I noticed since January of this year, we've had, I estimate, two. We, it may only be one, but I think it was two. One star. But they did not leave a text or review of it. So I'm they're cowards. You come fight me. Don't leave. <laughs> th- tell me why you're reviewing us one star if you're gonna do that, you coward. Just b- bait and just ah! anyways. I'm gonna wrap up the show right there before I have an aneurysm. Wow, you I didn't realize how much it bothered you. What, what one star reviews don't bother me when they explain themselves so I can laugh at them. Like like just leaving a one star, that's cowardly. That, that, uh, huh. The internet's full of cowards. I'm going to go leave a one star right now and tell you exactly why. You, first off, you don't have an iOS device. You can't. Uh, so <laughs> sure I can. I can still get on there. I'm on there right now looking at our reviews. Yeah, you can't leave a review without being on an iOS device, though. Really? really? Yeah, on, on iTunes, uh, on, on, on Apple Podcasts. Yeah. Now, you could go leave a review on Spotify. You use Spotify. And Spotify. I, I, I think you're wrong. I think I could sign up for Apple podcast and on my desktop and still oh i forgot you're right you know what i bet you're right i forgot there is a windows version of uh, uh for desktop i totally forgot i bet you're right i um I, you have to be in logged into apple podcast I'll, I'll, I'll bet you five bucks i can leave you a one-star review no i don't want that five <laughs> no That's, you're messed up because i think you're right no you know if 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 uh, maybe some of our listeners could go leave us better reviews and that would make Josh happy. We all, all want Josh to be happy. Yeah. So. It, it, yeah. If the dozens of you we've entertained, if you're, if you're actually happy with what we do for the community, no, nah, I, I would actually more appreciate it if they just hit the like button on the YouTube channel. That matters way more to me. Our Apple podcast audience is established. No, people who listen to us are not basing their listening to us off of a review they've read. They're either listening to us because they like us or this is their first time listening. And they're like, wow, I'm not going to do this ever again. But anyways, Rob and Ryan and Gary, thank you all so much for submitting your questions for this episode. The final reminder, get yourself a $25 gift card, friends, when you call and leave a voicemail to 325-305-6107. Again, I, I am getting low on voicemails. I have maybe nine or ten that I haven't listened to yet. So assuming they're all questions and they're all unique, we've got a few more weeks worth. So call it in and get rewarded for your effort. Todd and James, that is all I have for this week. I sincerely appreciate your time. I'm going to be up there for a day trip Monday to do the recipes for Trub Club. So I will see y'all then. See ya. Thanks. And that will do it for this episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, you could go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on that submit a question link at the top of the page, or even better, call it in, leave a voicemail to 325-305-6107. Thank you to our show sponsors like Munton's Malt. Premium grains for a better brew day. If you aren't already brewing with Munton's, give them a try by joining our Trump Club at a recipe receiving level. For the best hops available online, give our friends at hopsdirect.com a visit and pick up what you need for your next brew day. Also, get a pack of premium imperial yeast along with delicious recipes from us when you join the Trump Club. Go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour and come brew with us. On behalf of Todd Burns, James Carlson, and the Pearl Media Network, I'm Joshua Steubing. Thanks for listening. <laughs>